I love this series. Before we get to it, I want to highlight a couple of the announcements. As Jen said, Valentine's is just around the corner, and we have a special gathering for couples. It's called Fusion 2-1, and for those who don't know, uh, Fusion is a process where two things are combined to form one entity. It's a picture of God's process for marriage. And I won't repeat all the details, but just to let you know, um, this is being announced in all the churches. And so if you want to reserve a space, I encourage you to register soon. Uh, the other event I want to highlight is Friday Youth Night. Um, as Jen said, it was announced it's for all the middle and high school students. Uh, the thing you need to know is that it's not just our church. Um, we are hosting the event, but it's being sponsored by the Guam Ministerial Association. So all the youth groups from all the churches are invited to come. That's going to be here February 10th at 7 p.m. So it'll be fun with pizza and games and our special guest speaker, Dave Curry. So invite your friends. You know, here on Guam, um, it's hard to attend large conferences because you have to fly off island. So when the conference comes to us, I encourage you to jump in. <laughs> yeah, okay, so enough of highlighting events. Are you ready for the word? Okay, I love this series. Um, if there's one thing that would help in the struggles that we face, uh, a miracle would be great. If there's one thing that could bring hope in a dark situation, a miracle would make all the difference. Uh, how many of us could use a miracle? Yes, me too. You have a situation? Do you have a situation and as far as you can see, the only thing that's gonna allow it to change is a miracle? Um, if you do, I invite you to pray with me. Maybe it's a family situation, a relationship. Maybe it's a health concern. Maybe it's financial. Uh, but whatever it is, um, I invite you to pray with me. Father, you know, you know what's going on. You know my situation. And as far as I can tell, unless you intervene, it's not changing. And so I'm turning to you, and I'm asking you to do only what you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Terry and I had been planning and working on it for seven months. It was our wedding. Our reception was an outdoor reception at the home of Terry's parents. And we had a thousand guests. Yeah, it was one of those old fashioned Chamorro outdoor receptions <laughs> where you invite a family and that means all of their relatives too. <laughs> Your sister's cousin's uncle's friend, and you know how it goes. <laughs> and so we thought of everything, except one very important detail, which was the weather. The reception was outdoors, and our wedding was in July. How many of you know what the weather is like in July? On Guam, it's usually raining. And we decided to trust God against the odds. Some people thought we were foolish, but we had just come to experience God. We were new in our relationship with him, and he had radically changed us. And so we were open to the idea of, well, let's see what God will do. On the day of our wedding, I had just finished final preparations, and I was heading home to get my tuxedo. And interestingly, I was passing this church at the time I saw something very strange. In order to imagine what I saw, let me remind you of a little kind of geographic feature here on Guam. It's the cliff line beside this church. When you walk out and you go to the parking lot, it's on your right. That cliff line runs from Aganya all the way to Jigo. At the top of that cliff is the runway for the airport. And our reception was just on the other side of that runway. Uh, here's a map so you can see it. Uh, the church is at the top, and at the bottom is the Sure Stay Hotel, and the home that Terry grew up in is just behind the Sure Stay Hotel. 
Uh, back in those days, the hotel wasn't there. It was just an empty lot. One day, my brother and I took a whole day just to bush cut it to create parking for the wedding reception. Uh, the distance between here and there is just a half mile. It's a half mile from the cliff line. On the day of the wedding, I had just finished final preparations, and I was on my way home to get my tux. And I was passing this church when I saw it. Dark rain clouds, heavy dark rain clouds, just covering to mooning this whole area. But over here, above the airport, was clear, blue, bright, and sunny. And it was like there was a line that just followed the cliff line all the way to Jigo. That was my view, coming up Marine Drive, going north. It, it looked like this. We have a picture of it. Yeah, I had to do a little... Um, Photoshopping, but it was like that. I, I, I mean, it was so amazing. I was screaming in the car, I can't believe it! <laughs> Our wedding was at 4.30. That evening, we had a party, and it did not rain. <laughs> like the weather on my wedding day, we all have situations. Um, there's a situation... And as far as you can tell, unless God intervenes, it's not going to change. It's just not changing. Maybe it's something with your health. Maybe it's a situation with a family member, a friend. Maybe it's about money. And you need help. You need a miracle. You know, miracle is probably not the best word to choose. Um, by the way, this series is all from the book of John. We're looking at the seven miracles in the book of John. But John doesn't call them miracles. He calls them signs. Signs reveal the glory and the power of God. Because as amazing as a miracle may be, uh, the miracle in itself is not the point. The miracle is pointing to something greater. Or maybe I should say someone greater. Signs point us to God. And even then, the question is, why? Why? Why does God allow you to experience a miracle? To find the answer, join me as we read the story of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the pool of Bethesda, with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. And one of the men lying there had been an invalid for 38 years. 38 years. Think about this man's condition for a minute. What does it feel like to be lame for 38 years? I imagine the muscles in his legs had atrophied, just shriveled, you know, almost gone. Did he struggle with depression? Did he feel like giving up? When was the last time he felt happy? Verse 6, when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Instantly, instantly, the man was healed. Notice that Jesus did not ask the man, do you believe? He didn't ask the man, do you believe that I can heal you? This man had been paralyzed for 38 years. None of us would be surprised if he had felt like giving up. None of us would be surprised if he wished he didn't exist. What's my point? Jesus has the power to heal you even if you don't have hope. In other words, his power to heal is independent of you. His power stands alone. Jesus has the power to heal you and the people you pray for. I want you to hold that thought as we continue the story. Verse 9. But, 
this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But he replied, the man who healed me, he told me to pick it up, pick up my mat and walk. Who said such a thing as that, they demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. The Jewish leaders were upset when Jesus colored outside the lines. They were offended that the rules were not being followed. By the way, that's called legalism. Rules are okay, they serve a purpose, but the problem is when the rules become more important than the people. And Jesus reveals that people are more important than rules. But the religious leaders didn't get it, and they were offended. You know when you're offended, you miss the point? What is more important? The fact that the man who was lame was carrying his sleeping mat, or the fact that he was walking when we're offended, we can't see what's really important because we're focused on ourselves. Jesus invited them to stop thinking about themselves and think about what people need. That just made them even more mad. Verse 14. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now you are well, so stop sinning. Or something even worse may happen to you. And the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. Jesus said, now you're well, so stop sinning, or something even worse may happen to you. And think about that for a moment. What could possibly be worse than having been paralyzed for 38 years? Jesus is giving a warning. The warning is this. If you go back to your old life, something worse may happen. What is Jesus talking about? Well, there are several possibilities. One of them is found in Luke chapter 11, verse 24. Jesus said, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. And then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. And he replied, Blessed are those, blessed rather, are those who hear the word of God and obey it. You know, I love the way Jesus dialed in and keeps the conversation on point. You know, here he was getting praise from the crowd. And he didn't go there. He didn't let that distract him. He says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. That's the answer right there. The way to avoid going back to our old life is to hear the word of God and obey it. Now, I don't know if you saw it last week, but the 76 gas stations, they had a message on their sign. It said, knowing is not enough. You must apply. <laughs> and there's some wise messages they put up. <laughs> Sometimes I disagree, but some of them are really good. <laughs> you have to do it. We need to hear the word of God and obey it because the current of this corrupt world system that we live in will cause us to drift. And you know, the drift is not just on the outside. The drift is also on the inside. The sinful nature which inhabits our physical body. You know it's becoming more corrupt over time. The Bible says, I don't have the scripture up here, but it's Ephesians, I think it's 4, 24, 25. It says the sinful nature is being corrupted. It's in the present ongoing tense. In other words, it's getting worse over time. Did you ever notice that what you thought was bad at five years old is nothing compared to what you think is bad now? Now, when you were five years old, you thought maybe sneaking some extra candy was a big deal. It's not a big deal anymore. The temptations are much greater. The sinful nature is being corrupted. It's getting worse. But Jesus came so that we could have a new life. 
Like the lame man at the pool, Jesus comes to us and he asks us, do you want to be well? And I think all of us walked in here today, except our brother here. Glad you're here, bro. But most of us can walk. And yet, in other ways, many of us feel limited. Something limits us. Maybe it's my emotions. Maybe they're all over the place. Maybe it's my past. It's, it's just hard to let go. Maybe I'm hurt. I can't believe they did this to me. I need to forgive, but it's hard. Maybe I'm discouraged because of all the drama. It's in these places that Jesus comes to us and he touches us and he heals us from the hurt. If that's ever happened to you, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand and hold it up? In those broken places and God has touched you and healed, just everybody look around for a moment. Okay, thank you, you can put your hands down. You know it's in the broken places that Jesus comes and he heals us. These are signs. They're signs revealing the glory and the power of God. You know, I began this message by asking why. Why? Why does God allow us to experience a miracle? Jesus come to us in our brokenness and he brings healing. Yes, but why? The answer is in the story of the lame man. Jesus reveals a sign he does a miracle, you tell others what happened, and then Jesus says you're better, now go and sin no more. In other words, the purpose of the miracle is so that Jesus can lead you to live a new life. It's not an end in itself. It's a bridge, it's a spiritual marker to something greater. A sanctified life, the life that he intended for you from the beginning, a life according to your original design. He is restoring you. That's the pattern. He does a miracle so you will believe in him, so you will trust him, so that he can lead you into the new life. You know, this is the reason John wrote the whole account of the gospel. Uh, it's in John chapter 20. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs, in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. It's all for the purpose of leading you to be able to have life the way he designed it in the beginning. You know, if I could simplify today's message in a sentence, here it is. Miracles allow you to know God so you can trust him to restore your life. So how does that happen? Well, every day, fill your life with prayer, be in the word, ask God to fill you with his spirit, his light and his love and his power. Remember, we said we need a miracle, God. Unless you intervene, it's not going to change. That includes me. <laughs> you don't want your house to be empty when the enemy comes back with seven of his friends. You know my prayer for many years, Lord, would you just hide me in your unapproachable light where the enemy cannot see me or hear me? Lord, where I can be protected and just abide in your presence? Would you shut out all the other voices and allow me to hear you? That's just a continual prayer that I pray all the time. The battle is real. Every day I confess my sins and I ask the Lord to seal the access points by the blood of Jesus. The ear gate, the eye gate, the imagination, past memories. You know, as we do, our house will be like the homes of the Israelites in Egypt. They applied the blood of the lamb on the doorways of their homes and the death angel passed over. They were spared. As a result, they got free. 
And they began their journey to the promised land. That's a picture of what God is doing with you. The ten signs in Egypt, they weren't just to destroy the slave owner. The ten signs were so the people of God could believe, so they could get free, so they could begin living the life that God had for them, the new life. God reveals signs so that you can believe and get free and be living a new life. Amen? Sound good? Let's pray. Father, there are many ways that you have shown yourself. Lord, to the degree that we have seen, I ask that you would enable us to be faithful to what we have attained. Lord, for every person here this morning, as we come before you, I ask, Lord, that you would, if we could pause the music for a moment. Thank you. Father, thank you that you have revealed yourself. That's why we're here. I ask, Lord, by your grace, I ask that by the power of your spirit, you would enable us to go and sin no more. Lord, we don't want anything worse to happen. And Lord, it's not just us, it's, it's our children and our children's children. It's about changing the legacy and restoring the destiny that you have on our lives. And so God, let us take to heart this great gift that you've given us in your presence. Let us abide in you moment by moment and trust you to help us take the next step. Lord, I pray that the next three steps that we take will be our best. As we are moving forward in 2023, Lord, we know the battle is raging all around us, but where sin abounds, grace abounds. I thank you, God, for the week of prayer and fasting and Sunday worship. Thank you for your presence in the gathering today. And we pray, Lord, that by your spirit and your grace, you would enable us to be able to overcome the challenges, Lord, that try to kill and steal and destroy. And so, God, would you strengthen us. Strengthen us as your children. Enable us, God, to rise up with new hope and trust you, God, for today. Just help us trust you for today and then the next day. If you would keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to give you an opportunity just to do some business with God. Perhaps as you've been listening to me, the Lord is highlighting some specific things in your life. And whatever it is that he's inviting you to trust him, I want to give you some time just to do business with God and to respond to him in faith and trust and say, yes, God, I'm willing to put you first. I'm willing to follow you. And if that's your heart's desire, go ahead and take a moment just between you and God. Lord, you see every heart here this morning. You see every desire, every decision. Lord, would you take what we have? We present ourselves to you. Would you bless these desires, these decisions? And Lord, would you multiply them for your purpose? Not only in us, but in our families and our children's children. Lord, would you restore the destiny that you have on each one of us here? If you would keep your heads bowed, I want to address another group of people who may be here today as I'm talking about experiencing God. 
Perhaps you feel like God's been getting your attention lately. In fact, it may have a lot to do with why you're here today. You sense that something's been missing and you're thinking, you know what? Maybe it's my relationship with God. And if that describes you, but you've never actually made a conscious choice to let God come into your life, I'd like to give you an opportunity to do that, which is really simple. It's just a matter of making the choice God already knows and then expressing that to him. And we'll do that through praying. I'll pray out loud. You can pray along with me. God will hear you. But before I pray, I'd like to know who I'm praying with. And I have a signal for that, which is if you would simply look up. Then when my eyes meet yours, I'll know that we're going to pray together. And So if that's something you'd like to do, go ahead and look up at this time and we'll pray together in a moment. Here? Okay, very good. Anybody else? And there, I see you there. And here, okay. Anybody else? If I scan by too quickly, please raise your hand. Here, yes, I see you. And there, okay, very good. And there, and in the back, yes. And here, yes, I see you. And there, okay, anybody else? Okay, I see you there. Let's pray. God, I'm here. I do, I I sense you've been getting my attention. And so today I'm making a choice to open up. I choose to open my life to you. And I invite you to come in. Lord, I invite your spirit of forgiveness to come into mine. I thank you for Jesus and what he did to make this possible. If you're praying this prayer right now, just go ahead between you and God. Let his spirit come into yours. Just let him come in. This is the moment that he's been waiting for. This is the most important decision you have ever made. God, I thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence in my life. I thank you for forgiving me. Lord, I ask that you would give me a new start. Lord, the way it's been has been rough. And Lord, would you show me your way to live life? I ask that you would reveal yourself to me and make me the kind of person that you designed me to be. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give them a hand.